Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. This time we're finally getting somewhere with the MSVA and this is going to be a rundown video going through the manual, uh, telling you what I interpret from the manual that you need to do and then showing you on the bike how I've achieved this. So the way I plan to do this is basically just run through the manual. I've made some notes as well on my screens here and then take you on a little walk around um, and show you in detail. I know Andy Kirby, I'll put a link in the top right hand corner and down below to his video. He's done one covering his version, uh, but I'm going to cover mine because I've done some things differently and just to kind of put more information out there. So, without further ado, let's get on to the video. The first thing the manual talks about um, is the different categories that you can test. So mine is a two-wheel moped, not a low-power moped, that's like the 250-watt e-bike kind of stuff. Um, and then again, it walks through about what you're trying to achieve by going through the manual about getting the Minister's Approval Certificate, which is basically the form that they give you if you pass the test to then register the vehicle. Um, how they conduct the inspection, basically just saying they look around the vehicle and check that it matches the points in this manual here. And then stuff about category A, B and C, D, which are the different kinds of vehicles. So category A stuff only applies to mopeds, category B only to motorbikes and so on. You'll see it if you read through the manual. And another thing to note is the difference between amateur built, rebuilt and this other one here. Um, amateur built is what this is basically because I've taken all the parts, assembled it together by myself. It's not done for anyone. Um, and it's not done for a particular brand or anything. Um, so yeah, construction or assembly, a substantial part of the construction or assembly being carried out by the individual. And then rebuilt is basically one that's been built using existing parts pretty much. And uh, the first category we get onto is a stand, which is fairly self-explanatory. You can see what I've done here. Um, I think it's some kind of um, KTM stand for like a dirt bike. Um, and I've bolted it on like so. There's a plate down the back here with some bolts on it and that holds that nice and securely. And what it needs to be able to do is just hold itself in position uh, when it flips back. And also it's meant to be able to stop the bike from moving forward um, when it's put down, which it kind of does. Now in the manual it talks about an inhibitor down here, which basically means that it would stop the bike moving when it's put down like that. However, you don't need this. Um, Andy Kirby covered this again, um, and I've done my own research. So yeah, that's fine. Just a bog standard stand will do. Next up, we have mirrors. And as you can see, I have one fitted over here. Uh, I haven't got the other one fitted just because it takes up quite a bit of space. But basically, um, they just need to be able to have an E-mark on them, uh, which as you can see, my one does. Um, and that means that the glass is concave, um, which means it's got a slight kind of dip in it just give you a wider field of view um, and also it needs to have a minimum amount of viewing space which again if it's e-mart it should have that and this particular kind has like a kind of ball joint thing here so it can all adjust and rotate in all sorts the one thing I don't know is where on the handlebar it's meant to be placed whether it's okay to have it down here or whether it's meant to be more down here so it doesn't stick out as much but I think that's the kind of thing you could just quickly change on the day of the test just move it along the handlebars um, I can't see any problem with that I'll leave a comment below if I get any more cal clarification on that. Moving swiftly onto the speedometer, there's a few key points here. The main one um, is that it's in miles per hour, not kilometers an hour, um, that it's illuminated and that you can see it, which if you come over to one of my bike, um, it's all fine. These are some notes that I made about the different things. You can see the speedo, I just made some notes there. So if we turn the bike on, you can see that mine's already illuminated. It's an LCD, so that's not a problem. Oh, I'll come on to that in a sec. Um, that it's in miles an hour and that you know if you're riding it you can just kind of quickly glance down that's all good. Um, I know some of you are asking about a more detailed review of this LCD the QS um, whatever it is on the screen I put it um, but yeah so once I get to know it a bit better and actually been riding it I'll do a review on kind of how to connect it how to wire it up how to set it up all that good stuff. Moving on to the handlebar controls the first thing it talks about is the horn um, it just says it needs to emit a uniform sound um, can be operated with both hands on the steering, which as you can see that's fine just in reach there um, And also loud enough compared to the vehicle. Well in case you haven't noticed this thing's electric So that's gonna be no issue um, So yeah, you can just tap that um, And it's located just down here 
Um, I've done my best, as you can see, to insulate the wires. Um, we'll come into all the kind of build quality of the vehicle, that's a whole other section. Um, but yeah, just a bog standard horn, bolted it onto the indicator, and that wire just goes to the 12 volt system, um, intercepted by that switch up there. Now, the next section is a bit of a complicated one, all the lighting, because um, there's quite a lot of kind of optional, but also mandatory stuff, um, and it's trying to decide what you actually need. Um, and it talks all about, um, you know, if you've got twin headlights or multiple lights and all sorts, it's quite complicated. But the best section is, um, let me just try and find it, this table here, which tells you from moped what you need and what you don't need. So the only things you need are dip beam, rear position, stop light, registration light, uh, pedal reflectors if they're fitted, which as you can see are for me, um, and also a non-triangular rear reflector. Um, for that, I've just managed to zip tie one, um, like so, to the uh, mud guard, and that's as far back as possible, and it was the only way I could think of doing it, really, um, and I'm sure that will work just fine. As for the other kind of lights, you can see this is the position light here, which I've set to come on with this daytime running light at the front. Now, originally, I wasn't sure whether they're meant to have a switch so you can actually have all the lights on the bike off, it's say if you're riding during the day. Um, but the guy I emailed um, on this email address here, which I'm pretty sure I can put up, um, said that it's fine for them just to come on and off with the ignition, which basically means once the BMS is turned on, which I've made the starter switch here, um, it's okay for the daytime running light and position lights to come on with that. So that's all good. And then the dip beam, you can see turned on that. Again, I've done a whole video all on the lighting. And then main beam, it's just that one at the bottom there. Now with all the lighting, it says that you need to have telltales. So you can see that when I put the dip beam on, you get this one over here and then main beam changes this blue one over here. Uh, that's important, you need to have a telltale. That's one of the specs on the sheet. And a quick thing with the main beam, it's fine for the low beam LEDs to come on when the high beam's on as well, for them both to be on basically, that's absolutely fine which it does on mine. Now, interestingly, indicators are actually on the optional list of mopeds, but I've gone ahead and fitted them anyway because I plan to ride this on the road, and obviously indicators, pretty big safety feature. Um, so I've configured that to these switches on the left. Again, you can see it in the um, video how I've done it. And that just makes these flash like that. And again, at the back, like so. Now I did actually wire a buzzer up here for each side to act as an audible warning just to make it more notable, mainly to me, because um, it's quite hard, you can just about hear it. That relay, but when you've got your helmet on and everything, um, it's a bit harder. So again, I emailed the chat and he wasn't too sure whether an audible warning was okay for the indicators. He said it would have been for the hazards if they were fitted, um, which these aren't. That would basically just mean that both the sides flash at the same time i mean it'd be fairly easy just to add a button in uh, but you don't need hazard for a moped uh, but yeah so i've left the actual buzzers in you can just about see there's like a little black bulge there um, but i've just cut the wires so they don't sound and that should all be fine and a few last things on the lighting basically the indicators need to flash between 60 and 100 times a minute um, which these do i've made sure that's all fine um, on the lights, they need to be E marked. So if you have a look at the headlight, and again on the back tail light, you probably can't see. It. I'll get a picture up, but that's all E marked, and so are the indicators and everything. And that's the um, red number plate light under there. You can just see those white LEDs. Oh yeah, and one other thing they go about on in the manual is the practical most rear point um, for mounting of these. And from what I can tell from reading it, it doesn't include the tyre. Um, so the rearmost point for the bike at the moment is the end of this seat here and all the lights need to be within 30 centimetres of that rear point so I've basically put them as far back as I can. Now moving on to that little beeping noise you heard earlier, that comes under this unauthorised use category which is basically about the security of the bike. Now it's an optional category um, and mainly what it refers to is actually kind of steering inhibitors and stuff that would actually stop someone riding the bike. Um, but what I've done is obviously I've got a key key for the bike down here. You have the BMS, which has a Bluetooth app to turn it on on your phone. So you've got to have the app to turn it on. As now it's probably quite hard to see, but you can see this little box here with this blinking light. 
um, underneath the Sabaton tray here, I've basically I've screwed this little alarm which you can get off eBay which looks like this. Um, screwed it to the Sabaton and used some double sided tape to try and make it as secure as possible. And on the Sabaton itself, there's actually a wire, there's a USB wire which is used to power the Bluetooth dongle which is up in here. So what I've done is spliced that, got a USB cable running down the side and that then goes in up there to charge it which is what you can see that blinking LED from. This also means that there's actually a USB port on this bike which you could use to charge something up if you needed to. So a nice little kind of dual function there. And you use this key fob to um, control it. So if I press the arm button, it does that beep. Um, and that means it's armed. And then you can obviously unarm it. And it is pretty loud. I tried putting it inside the case and it was too kind of muted. So I've moved it to the outside, but kind of tried to cover it and protect it down here. And there's no real way of kind of ripping that out. Um, it's quite quite tucked away in there, so quite pleased with that. And I was thinking of adding some kind of like disc lock to the front, but that can wait. Um, that's not part of the test. However, they do say that any part of the locking system can't act directly on the brake. I don't quite know why, because that's literally what a disc brake does. Talking about brakes, this is one of the weird parts of the test. Um, and it concerns the brake levers actually. You can see on mine they've got this little ball on the end. That's one of the things that they talk about in the test under the external projection section, which is basically stuff that kind of sticks out on the bike, you know, the pedals, this handlebars. However, if you have pedals fitted like I do, then you can ignore all of this section apart from this one weird detail, um, which is the brakes here. And yeah, you can see what I'm on about here about this external projection. It's meant to be all sorts of technical details about how much stuff sticks out and all sorts, but yeah, you can pretty much just skip over it all. Now what that does do is limit the choice of brakes you can put on this, because um, there's only so many that have this ball end. Um, there's Tetro, obviously the Surons that I've got, and also the Magura five, MT5 brakes, I believe, have this on. So yeah, watch out for that. Don't, caught out, don't get caught out with that. Um, moving on to the subject of the brakes themselves, you can see there's two sections on it here, um, brake hardware and brake performance. The brake hardware basically says you need two brakes um, for front, which you can see I've got down here, I've got this four pot caliper um, and 203. It really should be a 205 mil rotor, but they're about 50 quid from Hope and I haven't bought one yet. Um, and again, on the rear, um, I've got a standard two pot caliper down here and a 160 mil disc. This is pretty lightweight. Um, but I'll come on to the braking performance in a sec and this will be absolutely fine. It's all pretty standard stuff like making sure there's no kinks in the hoses and that they're all kind of rooted fine, um, that the hoses aren't gonna rub. Now one thing with mine is that you can actually see this cable because of the way it's bent would rub on these stanchions here. Well, it wouldn't actually rub because it's upside down suspension. This bit, stay, this bit here stays still. Um, but anyway, I've wrapped some foam around it to add to the buffer so it's not actually rubbing on the cable and fingers crossed that's going to be fine. Another thing it talks about is having a little dial or reservoir um, to be able to see the oil level of the brakes which as you can see these ones do, um, these are the Suron brakes. Again a little bit of a weird thing because these brakes are all closed loop, there's no master cylinder on top but that's what they want and that's what you've got to have. Um, this also coincides with wanting a method to be able to compensate for pad wear, but these hydro hydraulic brakes, just by their nature, will do that anyway, um, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, finally, they talk about not using aluminium brake hoses, um, apparently because they can corrode, which makes sense, so yeah, again, just stick to the generic plastic wind and you'll be absolutely fine there. Um, and also, if you use regen, which I do plan on fitting this secondary throttle here, actually, so I get that in focus, um, to use regen, making sure it's progressive like with a throttle and not just a button that you can jam on. But personally, I'd stay away from regen for the test. It's an extra complication. They probably don't really understand it because they're used to doing petrol and motor vehicles. Um, so yeah, leave off regen for the test would be my recommendation. Going back to what I mentioned about the brake performance, there's this category here which tells you basically how strong the brakes need to be. Now on the front, I've got four piston calipers um, and on the back of two piston, as I said, four piston, that's gonna be more than enough. Um, two piston on the rear, again, that's absolutely fine. What they talk about is the ratio of the braking performance to the weight of the vehicle. Um, you can see here for a moped, um, it's 32% for the front and 25% for the rear. And there's a formula here you can use um, 
which is the braking force times 100 over the weight of the bike. Uh, but on the weight of the bike, you need to have 75 kilos um, to accommodate an examiner. Apparently, that's how much they think a person weighs. So the way I did this was I just took the bike out, got up to 20 mile an hour, um, did a brake test, you know, braking fairly hard. So I did some calculations based on the minimum braking force that they expect. And those gave distances of 16.3 meters just using the rear brake and 12.7 meters just using the front brake. So basically, if from 20 miles an hour your bike can stop in a shorter distance than that, then you're good to go. Now this bike at the moment weighs 68 kilograms, which is quite porky for this kind of style of e-bike. Um, a lot of the other ones I've seen are around the 50 kg mark, and that's actually what I was aiming for. But I think it's this steel frame that's letting me down. This has got to be close to 20 kilos just on its own. Um, so yeah, with 68 kilos of weight, those are the kind of figures you're looking to get. So if you're getting under that, you're fine. One thing just to add on that is that obviously if the wheels lock when you're braking, especially the rear one, um, then that's deemed sufficient for them to have enough braking power because you can't get any more braking power if the wheels are locking. Um, and the brakes should feel smooth and not juddery. Again, pretty self-explanatory. One little thing I nearly ran into is just making sure there's enough clearance for the brake levers not to hit anything such as this um, mirror mount here and likewise on the other side. Um, obviously that would be a pretty big failure if the uh, brake levers were obstructed, so just be careful of that. Moving on to the tyres, again this is a fairly quick and simple one, it's just making sure that they're suitable for the bike really. If you've got any kind of main brand ones, uh, these are Michelin um, City Pro tyres, so you know that's big brand, you'll be absolutely fine. It's just making sure they've got the um, correct markings, so you can see this one. Um, has a dot marking there and also an E marking right here so as long as you've got an E mark, dot mark or GIS is the other one you'll be absolutely fine. Um, another thing to note is making sure that the tyres are fitted the correct direction these ones have um, rear and front on them so just make sure they're fitted in the correct direction of um, movement else that will be a failure and making sure that the front and rear tyres are the same kind, i.e. bias ply or radial. But if you're buying them in a set, you're pretty much guaranteed that. Finally, with the tyres, just checking they've got a sufficient load and speed rating. But given this thing can only do 28 mile an hour and 4 kilowatts because it's a moped, that's going to be no problem. Which brings us on to the final topic of design and construction. Now this category is basically how well the bike is put together as a whole, checking sure that the frame is secure, that things are attached to it properly, that everything's adequate capacity. Um, and those two words, adequate and secure, keep cropping up again. The key things I picked up on were, first of all, making sure that the frame is adequately welded and put together. This one, you can see, you know, it's got good strong welds. It needs a clean, actually. Welds, even. Um, and again, up here and all round. If you want to see my frame unboxing, then it's one of the first videos from nearly two years ago, so go check that out. But yeah, that's the first thing, making sure that the frame is good and structurally sound. And now these next points are ones that are going to take a bit of time because um, it's basically making sure that everything's properly attached to the bike. Um, so things such as the indicators, if you've got them fitted, you know, these are these are bolted on. Um, you've also got stuff like the um, horn, you know, making sure that's attached all fine. The throttle is not going to go anywhere, that the dashboard's all secured on. Um, just basic construction points really. Um, also stuff underneath, you know, this belly pan, that's on nice and securely. Um, checking that, you know, the wheels haven't got any play in them, um, front or back. Um, I've also recently fitted this chain tensioner to stop the chain from moving around. And on a similar thread, we have all the cable routing stuff. Um, so I've done my best just to tie cables down as much as I can. Um, you can see up here, I've tried to bunch it all together. I even put this little plastic cover on the top. Um, and then moving round to the front, I've made an effort, big effort here as well actually. This took a long time um, to get all the cables bundled together. Um, you can see how they come from over here, um, down here, meet in the middle, um, tied to the handlebars um, where possible. Um, and then fixed to the forks as well down here, sorry if that's not in focus, there we go, fix the forks here, um, I've used this braiding where possible um, or where necessary just to give that extra layer of protection because um, when they go into the case like down here 
you need grommets around the wires to protect it from chafing. I've got one down there as well. Um, and also one over here for the rear light. You can see that there, one on here. Um, for where it first comes through. Couple quick notes on the steering. Um, they talk about when you're steering, you need to make sure that any wires down here aren't pulled taut. Um, I've done quite a bit of moving around to make sure that none of them are. It looks like, you know, it's a close fit. They look all quite tight there, um, but like the brake lines, you know, they're rigid, um, so they're gonna look taut. Um, but none of it gets um, out, out the way when you turn. I can't really demonstrate it very well here, but that's all fine basically. Also on the top of the steering, making sure that when you turn, it only um, touches parts that it's meant to, which in my case are these um, rubber, rubber grommets here, um, which are like dampers. They came with the fork, so I'm leaving them on. Um, rather than touching this headlight bracket or whacking into the key or something else, um, that's quite a big one. And just for good luck, they say consider all this stuff that I've just talked about when accelerating, braking, cornering, so that none of that's gonna make a difference, that nothing's gonna kind of shoot forward when you brake or get squashed when you accelerate because the rear shock's gonna compress or whatever. So leaving enough room between the saddle and the shock and the mud guard and all that kind of stuff. With wiring in particular, they talk about how it needs to be um, of adequate capacity to carry the current. Um, so stuff like for the headlight, um, obviously this being an electric bike, they might just want to see the power wires which are tucked away down there, that big red wire, but that's going to be absolutely fine, that can handle the current. One thing they point out is that if you're routing long wires such as the phase wires um, or the rear brake cable, um, it must be secured at at least 30 centimetre intervals, um, which this is. And also they want you to route the wires through the frame itself. Um, I've done mine underneath here as you can see, um, rather than just having it kind of down the side here or whatever so that they're protected as well and likewise giving room at the front for the suspension to collapse now I don't actually know what the total amount of travel is I suspect I'm gonna get nowhere near the what is it 200 mil that they claim for this um, and that that's not gonna hit into that I've seen many bikes with much less gap than that um, so again I, I think that'll be absolutely fine I'll tune the suspension um, to handle all this once I've got it through the test and get it actually on the road. So yeah, they're basically checking that you, you put the bike together properly, that it's well built, that you know what you're doing. Um, reading the manual is going to be a big help, giving you the confidence that you know exactly what they're talking about, what they're expecting, that there's going to be no kind of surprise shocks when you turn up and you're kind of, oh, I didn't know I needed to do that. So yeah, making sure that you've read the manual, I've gone through and I've actually made a condensed version uh, which is about 50 pages long which I've been going off which is what I think is the core things that you need to know um, for the moped but it's good to read through the full 200 pages um, to give you an idea of all the stuff that they could ask you or if you're doing a different bike they could ask you and just the general structure of the test. And of course don't bring it into the centre with mud on it, make the effort to clean it before, it just gives a better impression. Thank you.